The effort to bolster access to environmental information, participation, and justice in building a more sustainable world from our corner intensifies through the Escazú Agreement as St. Lucia and other signatories prepare for its first conference of parties to be held later on this month in South America. Hello and welcome to another installment of Issues and Answers on the National Television Network, a production of the Government Information Service. I am Jessie Leons from the Information Unit of the Department of Sustainable Development. I'm joined by my colleague, Ms. Kate Wilson, Legal Officer in the Department of Sustainable Development, who will be St. Lucia's delegate in the upcoming Escazú COP. Kate, thank you so much for being here uh, to speak to us about Escazú overall. Thank you very much, Jesse. In fact, the pleasure is all mine. Wonderful. Before we get into the upcoming event, which is monumental for Escazú and environmental, um, environmental, uh, the space that we're in, speak to us about the prompting for, for this this type of agreement and and the origin account really of the Escazú agreement. Okay, so the Escazú Agreement, which is more aptly termed the Regional Agreement on Access to Information, Public Participation, and Justice in Environmental Matters, not only in the Caribbean, but also in the Latin American region. And this, uh, this agreement came about uh, way back when, in 1992, there was a conference known as, the, it, it took place in the capital of Brazil, Rio de Janeiro. It was a conference on sustainable development and the environment. And at that conference, about 179 countries unanimously agreed that uh, environmental matters were not matters that should be dealt with by the governments alone that they were cross-cutting in nature and because of that they need all stakeholders needed to be involved in the decision making particularly the public the public ought to be given information that is within the purview of, of, of public authorities they should disseminate that information to the public in a timely manner they should give the public information that particularly information that is hazardous to their health that is hazardous to the environment and this this whole concept of access rights that is giving them access rights to environmental information letting them publicly participate in the decision making and also get giving them access to justice came up again mm -hmm. in 2012 at what was known as the Rio Plus Conference. Those countries met again in Rio de Janeiro in 2012 and again access rights was on the agenda. And 25 principles came out of this, the Rio, the 1992 and the, 19, uh, and the 2012 conferences. And the 10th principle was what was known as Principle 10 speaks directly to access rights, giving mm -hmm. access rights to environmental information. And that was the basis of the negotiations by which this Escazú agreement came about. Okay, wonderful. So the Escazú agreement is the regional agreement on access to information, public participation, and justice in environmental matters in Latin America and the Caribbean. Definitely. You mentioned some of the previous um, uh, treaties, environmental agreements that have been the foundation for the Escazo Agreement. We will come to that in just a moment. But first, um, speak to us about a little bit more about the prompting for this type of agreement. Uh, what was the region's status where access to en environmental information is concerned? And is our situ situation unique as compared to the rest of the world? Okay, well, you find that um, the Caribbean region in particular Whilst we have freedom of information laws, we have environmental laws, we have fiscal planning laws, which, have, which speak indirectly to having access to information, our laws do not specifically speak to 
having the right to say a healthy environment. Mm -hmm. Certain regions of the world, uh, the, the right to a healthy environment is already enshrined in the constitution, like the right to life mm -hmm. or the right to associate, you know, to for, for freedom of association. So this is where, and being we, the Caribbean countries are such vulnerable countries mm -hmm. in terms of our risk, uh, our margin of risk when it comes to things like hurricanes, climate change, sea level rise, you know, biodiversity loss and that sort of thing land degradation, mm -hmm. it was so very important for us to have an agreement. And this agreement, this Escazú agreement was forged by our people of the LAC region, the Latin American mm -hmm. and Caribbean region, for our people. So that we can now have, go to a public authority and say, listen, mm -hmm. The, this project is going on in the, in the community and I fear it may displace my family or it may, have, it may be detrimental to the biodiversity, mm -hmm. the flora and fauna. We should have a copy of your, your impact assessment mm -hmm. or we should have some indication as, what, as to what you intend to do if we are to be displaced. You, you, you see, so these sorts of things were very, very important. Mm -hmm. And so the governments felt it was time for us to sit down and negotiate an agreement that we can make this thing happen. And that is how the Escazú Agreement has reached that far. Okay, so you spoke to, about the extent of the environmental concerns, our a unique predicament here in the region with um, natural disasters and what have you. And you also mentioned development concerns. Yes. Uh, what are some of the outstanding provisions of the agreement and how will the average St. Lucian be able to benefit from these? Okay, so the agreement has three main components. The first component is access to information. Mm -hmm. The middle component is public participation and the third component is access to justice. Now under the first component, which is access to information, it speaks to um, establishing environmental information systems. Mm -hmm. And St. Lucia, thankfully, ha is way ahead of the, the, the rest of the region. We have already created uh, an NEIS, an National Environmental Information System. Mm -hmm. We also have an open data portal and we also have an open data policy. So mm -hmm. what we are required to do therefore now is to feed our NEIS with information like the state of the environment uh, reports, with um, our national adaptation plans, our, you know, mm -hmm. anything to do, our treaties, uh, you know, that we have signed like our, our CDB, our, you know, our um, um, conference, um, Convention on Biodiversity, mm -hmm. the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement, all those things should be placed in that, um, that portal on the NIS mm -hmm. so that persons from the public can, you know, can readily access that kind of information. The other thing that um, this first component speaks to, it speaks to having a recognized procedure. So where a public authority, so what the government is, uh, is expected to do, or the state party is expected to do, is to designate what are known as competent authorities. And these are persons or organizations or agencies that would be, say, for example, the, the public health um, department, the Department of Environment. These are agencies that would normally hold um, information about the environment or information that is associated with the environment. Mm -hmm. And so they would have a recognized procedure so that if the public wants to get, say, information about, uh, uh, say, a pond that has mercury in it, that they can, you know, through that recognized procedure, ask of that public authority mm -hmm. information about that. Information that may be hazardous to the, as I said, to the environment as well as to public health. And, and the that public competent public authority would have to go through a public interest test mm -hmm. in terms of balancing the interest of the public to know as well as the interest of the state to or the agency to to withhold the information mm -hmm. and you know so that you would have a procedure where if they are if they have decided for some reason that they are going to withhold the information they have to indicate that to the person requesting the information and they would have to give reasons so there should be a recognized procedure mm -hmm. so all of that is embedded in the provisions of the Escazú agreement and mm -hmm. we can speak of it as length but I mm -hmm. want to give you 
very briefly what the three main components. But just to stick a pin in that, we yes. are due for our first break. St. Lucia and other signatories of the Escazo Agreement are preparing for the first conference of parties That's right. to be held in Chile later, later on this month. We will get into the details of that in just a bit. We are speaking to St. Lucia's delegate, legal officer in the Department of Sustainable Development, Ms. Kate Lewis, and she's essentially St. Lucia's Escazo lady. Kate Wilson. <laughs> Kate, Kate Wilson, sorry. Uh, St. Lucia's Escazo lady. So stay tuned for that and more coming up directly after this break. Thank you so much for staying tuned. This is an edition of Issues and Answers on NTN, a production of the Government Information Service. If you're just joining, thank you so much for doing so. We are talking the Escazú Agreement, the first ever conference of parties for that, of which St. Lucia is a signatory, uh, will be happening later on this month in Chile. And we are speaking to legal officer in the Department of Sustainable Development, Ms. Kate Wilson. She will be our delegate for uh, this conference of parties. And we've been speaking so far on the Escazú Agreement for the benefit of the viewership who may not have heard about the Escazú Agreement, just giving you a brief outline of uh, the agreement and, of course, what we can expect at the COP. Coming off of the break, before coming off onto the break, we had uh, you speaking on some of the outstanding provisions of the agreement and how the average St. Lucian is able to benefit from from these, in, of course, in full force of the agreement. And in the broader context, Kate, I, I want you to speak about the concerns that the agreement will help to address in our stage of development, the societal ideals that we have, looking yeah. at the sustainable development goals, um, human rights, sustainable development overall. What impact will it have on our important sectors? You mentioned development earlier. Of course. Uh, certainly, it will have a huge impact, mm -hmm. Jesse, because you know nothing can happen effectively progress cannot uh, and even development cannot occur unless you have access to information mm -hmm. if you do not have information about even the hours to go to school you can't go to school you understand mm -hmm. so if you have environmental information readily available we can make choices about our health we can make choices about how we how we um develop our homes, mm -hmm. how we structure our, our homes. So we can now, when we are building, we are building more sustainable homes, mm -hmm. you understand? Because we want to make our, our country sustainable and resilient to disasters. We want to reduce our, 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 our risks. And so having information available is going to be very, very important. And so this agreement is pivotal. It is critical, particularly at this point in time when you know we are faced with sea level rise. We are faced with, I mean, you, you heard at the, 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 the UNFCCC um, mm -hmm. COP recently, the issues that we need to lower our emissions. We need mm -hmm. to get our sea level, you know, you get our, our issues on an even keel because we are coastal islands. We are mm -hmm. islands, you understand? Mm -hmm. We are not big land masses. Uh, and that have lots of money. We are tiny islands which are exposed. So mm -hmm. having uh, environmental information at our fingertips is critical. The second thing is public participation and the agreement has provisions. It has for the creation of modalities where the public mm -hmm. can give their voice. Mm -hmm. Because you hear many times people are talking about projects that the government you know, stats or uh, mm -hmm. uh, an agency stats, and then when it has impacted the environment or it has impacted the people, then you, you understand there's a big uproar. No, mm -hmm. the p people, the public, especially civil society, ought to be given the information beforehand. And they ought to be consulted at every stage of the process, not when harm has occurred and we want to reverse the harm. When you have killed out off the, ma the mangroves, which have been, you know, have been nurtured for years, how are you going to replace it in a year or so? No, especially environmental matters are matters like 
say a forest, mm -hmm. how long it takes for a tree to grow, you understand? Mm -hmm. When you cut the, indiscriminately cut down our forests, or you just, when persons are drinking from the plastic bottles after they've bought the, you know, the, the, the water, and they just throw them out on the streets if mm -hmm. they're in a, in a vehicle, and it gets into our waterways and it gets into the oceans, where does it end up? In the belly of the fish. So that is why we have, we have agreements to deal with plastics. You, um, look, UNEA just ended, the United yeah. Nations Environmental Assembly, and there was agreement for there to be a global you know, agreement on plastics, on controlling plastics. It's the same thing with Escazú. This was our, re our countries of the Latin America and the Caribbean coming mm -hmm. together and saying, listen, enough is enough. We need to get access to information, we need to get the public involved, and we need to get the judiciary, the persons who are involved in the arbitration of justice to know that, listen, we need to put structures in place. Mm -hmm. We need to lower the cost of how high it is to take a matter to court. Mm -hmm. We need to put structures in place, for example, a committee to uh, support compliance and implementation. So if St. Lucia decides, okay, we have ratified, but we are not going to abide by the provisions, what can be done? We can mm -hmm. take away your voting rights. Mm -hmm. You understand? Or we can we put sanctions on the country. The, the commission, the, the Escazú um, secretariat together with the mission can send somebody down to St. Lucia and see is St. Lucia complying with its provisions? And mm -hmm. if it is not, decide, look, St. Lucia need, uh, is given a, a particular amount of time to, mm -hmm. to, to comply. And if not, we take away your voting rights or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. So the, the agreement to speaks to all of that. Mm -hmm. More importantly, the agreement speaks to capacity building and cooperation. And it doesn't just speak about cooperation in, on the island, like in St. Lucia between the agencies. It also speaks to cooperation on an inter-island level. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we have been doing is uh, myself and um, Antigua and Barbuda, we have teamed up to help countries that have not, even though they were very involved in the negotiations of the Escazú Agreement, mm -hmm. have not reached the stage of ratifying. So as we are get, getting ready to go to COP in two weeks' time, we have reached out to Dominica and mm -hmm. assisted them in the mobilization effort so that they can themselves join us and, 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 and ratify. And we are doing the same thing for Grenada. We'll be doing this um, this coming week with Grenada. We'll mm -hmm. be meeting with the Grenada officials. And so successful has this thing been that now the Bahamas wants to come on board. Trinidad and Tobago is now interested in, in us giving them assistance mm -hmm. and Belize. So wow. cooperation is something that we need to do on the Escazú Agreement. It's the perfect way to start. It's, it's inspiring that St. Lucia is in, in a position to be able to provide assistance oh, yes. to others. Uh, what stage is are, are we at, St. Lucia at, in terms of compliance with the agreement and where do we stand as compared to some of the other parties? Okay, well, St. Lucia, as you know, we were one of the first 11 and 14 countries who signed the agreement when it was open for signature. We signed it on the 27th of September, 2018. We spent two years, we had a robust public awareness campaign. You remember mm -hmm. you were part of that. We did that from 2018 to 2020, mm -hmm. St. Lucia ratified and the agreement came into force because it needed 11 countries to have ratified. Now we have 12, I think even more than 12, that have now ratified. So the agreement came into force on Mother Earth Day, which was April 22nd of last year. Wow. Now the conference of parties has to be held one year after it enters into force, which is why it is being held this year. Mm -hmm. But what we have done in St. Lucia is that not only have we had a robust public awareness campaign, as I told you, we've gone on the ground. We've gone in every community. We've speaking to persons on the ground. We've mm -hmm. gone into the schools from the from the infant schools right up to the tertiary level. We even infiltrated the the uh, the library and the, the summer camps for the kids. We went there to, to spread the message to the kids. So um, we worked together closely with um, Dr. Maurice Louis Felix, mm -hmm, who yes. is at the highest tertiary institution, the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. And we teamed up with um, the person, the focal point at the uh, Department of Sustainable Development, Janelle, Vol Janelle Volney, Volney mm -hmm. who is the person for Sustainable Development Goals. Mm -hmm. So we, we bought a message where I was speaking about uh, the Escazú Agreement. She was speaking about how it, it fits into the whole achievement Agenda. of the Sustainable mm -hmm. Development Goals to the kids and to the students, because they're not kids, the, 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 the grown-ups at Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. And it was such a marvelous thing. They were so very interested. Mm -hmm. The 
Eskazu Secretariat, that is the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, ECLAC, UN ECLAC, mm -hmm. based in Santiago de Chile, they have an online course that mm -hmm. you can take, it's free of charge, to get to know about the Eskazu Agreement. And so we were speaking to Sir Arthur Lewis to see if they can introduce it into the Sustainable Development Program mm -hmm. because they teach a very hands-on course there at there, Sir yes, Arthur Lewis they do. Community College. So a lot is happening. What I really want to say as well, and I'm so very happy about that, mm -hmm. We, 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 ha we have to take a break. I'm okay. getting the word from the producer. Um, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to hear from you on that. And I also want to find out how conducive is our institutional and legal frameworks okay. for um, an agreement of this nature. Excellent. Do stay with us. We'll be Thank you so much for staying tuned. You are watching Issues and Answers on NTN. We're talking the Escazú Agreement and the first ever conference of parties to be held uh, for this uh, agreement being made in our part of the world, the Latin America and Caribbean region. We are speaking to the delegate who will be representing St. Lucia uh, later on this month in Chile. And she's been speaking to us about Escazú, the agreement, uh, the origins uh, from the start of our interview all the way down to the levels of, of work that has been achieved so far since our signing onto yeah. this agreement. So we had to break you uh, for us to go to a, a break. You can continue and we will continue with the uh, questions. Right, so very quickly what I want to say, Jesse, is that I'm so thrilled that our cabinet of ministers mm -hmm. has endorsed and adopted our concept note. Now, what is our concept note? Our concept note is that document which is our blueprint for how we are going to implement the provisions of the Escazú Agreement. And, I mean, it, it, we, we, I, 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 over the Easter holidays, last Easter, I, I, I told you, I sat down and I went with a fine tooth comb mm -hmm. to see what it is that we need to do at the national level to ensure that we effectively implement this agreement. And the agreement is very clear on what should be in its place. It has the, the establishment of a pollutants register. You know, it has the NEIS, as I said. Mm -hmm. It also speaks to having um, independent, of, um, independent oversight mechanisms. So all of that is in that concept note. So I'm so thrilled. What's the significance of that coming from the approval from cabinet? Because without cabinet endorsement, we don't have buy-in from the mm -hmm. public. We need the approval of cabinet because these are national things that we are going to be putting in place. We are going to have to look at our constitution to, to ensure that it, it, it includes access rights. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't do that on our own without cabinet's approval. If we are going to amend our legislation to ensure it has, it is very clear in terms of access rights provisions, we need cabinet's approval for that. So a lot mm -hmm. of the establishments and the procedural and institutional frameworks that we needed to do, we needed the approval of the highest authority, which is why that concept note endorsement was so very important. Wonderful, which, which leads to my next point, asking about how can conducive are the institutional and legal frameworks uh, for Escazú's provisions. Okay. Uh, you've just, uh, yeah. Right, well, as I mentioned very briefly um, before, there are, we have three levels of, 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 of um, legislation in St. Lucia that speaks to access rights. Mm -hmm. uh, we have our freedom of information laws, we have our environmental laws, we have our physical planning laws, and of course we have our constitution. But you find that those laws that we have presently, they just speak to access rights on the periphery. Mm -hmm. They are not clear in terms mm -hmm. of saying we, we have a right to a healthy environment. So we need to, what we, have, we, we are doing, and we have already started because the World Resources Institute had chosen St. Lucia as one of, th among three other islands to review our legislation and to make recommendations. And one of their main recommendations was for us to enact the Freedom of Information Bill, which has been around for a while. But what we are doing is, because this thing has been a, 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 a 
has been there for a while and was never passed, we are now reviewing it. We are looking at it again to see how we can put access rights to environmental information, make it very, very explicit in mm -hmm. the provisions, not something that we need, to, we have to look, we have to see through. Mm -hmm. So that when you pick up the, the legislation and you look at it, it's very precise on that. We want to look at our constitution to see, you know, how conducive it is to make the right to a healthy environment, uh, uh, you know, a fundamental right. Mm -hmm. So these are the things we are doing now at the moment. And as I said, all of the other things that we are we have put in place in that concept note now that the cabinet has approved it we are getting ready to meet with the different agencies because obviously you know as i said before environmental issues are cross-cutting issues we cannot do it on our own the department of sustainable development cannot do it on its own so the Ec Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, ECLAC, which is the secretariat for um, the Escazú Agreement, they have an enhanced program of action for the implementation of the Escazú Agreement. They signed an MOU with the OECS Commission. So we are working closely with the OECS Commission. They have already held, that is ECLAC's statistical division, mm -hmm. has worked with our statistical office, our CSO in St. Lucia, and the Department of Sustainable Development to develop environmental indicators together with a number of other agencies. So we are going to be meeting with those agencies again. We are going to come back to the judiciary. Remember mm -hmm. earlier on, we had met with our chief justice, our judges, mm -hmm. our yes. masters, the Bar Association, the Workers Union. So we are going to be doing that again, because now we are not just going to ask them their opinion. Now we are ready to put structures in place to get down to the nitty gritty. Armed with the endorsement yes, of cabinet. Yes, that is it. And I'm sure you're beaming with pride going into COP with this oh, approval from cabinet. I am so happy. <laughs> I'm so ecstatic. We're running out of time, but tell us a little bit more about the Conference of Parties. When, where um, is it happening? Okay, so very briefly, it is going to be held on the, from the 22nd of April to the 20th of April to the 22nd in Santiago de Chile. It is going to be at the headquarters of the Escazú Secretariat. So it is at, it's going to be at ECLAC's headquarters, mm -hmm. which is in downtown Santiago. On the first day, well, on the 19th, which is the day preceding the opening of the meeting, there will be a meeting of an official meeting of the presiding officers okay. then on the monday which is the 20th there's going to be the official opening which of course is going to be broadcast live so we hope that everybody in st lucia <laughs> please tune in so you can see your the representation on behalf of your country so log in so we have the official opening then there will be uh if very briefly there will be um a special session. No, first of all, the countries are going to be speaking about the actions which are being taken at the national the level. Mm -hmm. So we'll be reporting on what is happening in St. Lucia. Other countries are going to be reporting. So do, do tune in. Please, do tune in. Then later in the afternoon, we have a special session, which is towards effective implementation of the Escazú Agreement and greater cooperation. Then on the Thursday, which is the 22nd, we will be dealing with the rules of procedure because you know the COP, for it to function it effectively, it has to agree on its rules. Mm -hmm. So for the fast, past few days leading up to the, the conference of parties, we've been deliberating on the rules. Mm -hmm. St. Lucia sits on a working group together with Panama and Uruguay, uh, Uruguay and Costa Rica, mm -hmm. who was um, fine tuning the rules for the Committee on Compliance and Implementation, a very important committee. So we'll be discussing that and the COP has to endorse that. Also, the financial provisions. How are we going to pay for all those things that we intend yeah. to do? So the, 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 the voluntary fund, all of that is going to be discussed at the COP. Then remember, it is, it is going to be the anniversary of the first of the, um, of the entry into force. On Earth Day. Right, mm -hmm. on Earth Day. So April 22nd, which is the Friday, there's going to be a huge celebration. So ECLAC has wonderful things for us. But we will be hosting a side event on the Escazú Agreement. It, it is, the theme is the Escazú Agreement as a catalyzing tool towards more just, responsive, and gender-inclusive societies. So we have a wonderful panel there. We have Mr. Chamberlain Emmanuel from the OECS Commission. We have Mr. Jose Luis Samaniego from the ECLAC, uh, from the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. We have Ms. Ruth Spencer from the MIPA Trust of Trinidad. We have Ms. Um, Com Compton Antoine Janine Compton from the St. Lucia mm -hmm. National Trust. And um, we have a, a, a group from Belize. Mm -hmm. You know, so we have a wonderful panel and we're asking you to please when we, we, together with the GIS, we are going to be putting out the links so that mm -hmm. you, can, you can log in and listen to the conference of parties, the first ever 
of the Escazú Agreement. We do invite the general public to follow the Department of Sustainable Development's platforms where we will be featuring the various events of the COP for the Escazú Agreement, uh, su Sustainable Development of St. Lucia on the Facebook platform. On Instagram, we susdev. S-L-U, S-U-S-D-E-V-S-L-U. -S -S -E you can go on there and also onto our LinkedIn um, platform, the same names as well, to support and be part of the movement that is the Escazú Agreement. My name is Jessie Léonce. It's all the time that we have for now in this installment of Issues and Answers, taking a look at the first ever conference of parties for the Escazú Agreement. Uh, do stay tuned for more programming on the NTN. Goodbye. <laughs>